Hey everybody, what's going on? Um, this is, video is going to be a little bit different than what I'm typically, what I've typically done in the past. Uh, this one's just going to be me discussing the real risks of losing everything as a day trader. And this is going to stem beyond just being a day trader, right? Uh, right now is definitely a tumultuous time in the industry. Right? There's a lot of U.S. traders, myself included, that relied on a lot of these Forex prop firms. Uh, and you're seeing me make the shift to futures. Now, that's just because I have to be able to adapt to the current environment. And if the current environment is not allowing me to trade a specific asset, well, as a trader, I just need to adapt to a different market. You know, it's not the end of the world. I can trade other markets. I can trade other time frames. I have the skill set built where I could essentially trade anything. Um, but there's a real risk if you continue with Forex problems that you're not going to be able to, you know, possibly provide for your family or if you were hoping that these for, these prop firms were going to propel you to full-time trader status. So being able to adapt to any environment that you're in is extremely important. Uh, you know, if one thing is not working for you, you have to jump to another thing. Or if there's too much risk in a certain market, you have to change to another one, right? Like if they're, just as an example, right? If you were running, um, you know, let's say a phone book service, right? And now everything's computerized. Well, you're running a major risk by staying in that specific industry and not adapting to the, to the technology or the shifting landscape of the new market. And we see it time and time again where some businesses just stay so stuck in their ways that they can't move on or they can't adapt to what's going on around them. And that's a, that's a really big thing that I think as traders we have to co constantly adapt to. So there's a couple different things that I want to talk about when it comes to risk. And, you know, there's hidden risks and there's risks that we can see. So when it comes to hidden risks, again, it's things that are not in our control. Like we cannot control what's going on in the prop industry unless you're a major player in the industry, which I'm currently not. Um, I know some of the people in the industry and how they're operating, but that doesn't in no way mean that I can change the industry myself, right? So that is a hidden risk that I'm always aware of just because a good amount of my income was coming from prop firms, right? The majority of my income was coming from prop firms. Uh, people think, uh, oh, I'm an affiliate. You get paid for affiliate marketing. Like you guys can check, I'll send you guys my affiliate links. I've only made like less than a thousand dollars from affiliates. And most of it is from trading, right? So th there's a real risk if these firms go down that I won't be able to provide or create that income that I'm so used to now. Um, so with that risk makes me, you know, it forces me to build up my personal accounts more. It forces me to uh, be more conservative with the risk in those personal accounts, right? Because if everything went to shit, I have to be able to take that personal account and actually make a living off of it. Now... Um, when it comes to losing everything as a day trader, right, and it's not just day trading, and I'm going to talk about a couple examples that I've seen um, just recently, as well as some things that I've picked up uh, from reading books, etc. But I think a lot of people think that once you become a full-time trader, that everything is like, you know, sunshine and rainbows, like you found the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you know, with the lucky lepre leprechaun, when in reality, it's nothing like that. Like, there's always risk in losing everything on the next trade. And that's something that maybe you guys, a lot of you guys don't understand as a trader. Maybe you haven't seen it, but uh, we'll, you know, we'll discuss a couple examples that I've noticed, at least, of people just getting overexposed when they get too confident. So the first example that I want to talk about is Jesse Livermore. If you guys haven't heard of Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, I'll flash a little image right here and provide a link down in the description. Uh, it's one of my favorite books because it takes you back to a time where it wasn't electronic trading, which we're all used to. Uh, so Jesse Livermore was a famous trader back in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s. And essentially he started out in bucket shops. So a bucket shop was essentially a non-regulated firm that was trading these stocks, right? But they were all, uh, the data feed was pretty much terrible. It was essentially a B-book broker. Like they were never putting your rocket through, through to the 
to the, I mean, they were never putting your order through to the market. So back then with the bucket shops and how he was able to take advantage of them was uh, they had a spotter that had a pair of binoculars that would look onto the floor of the exchange, the actual exchange, and they would be able to see the live price of the market. Meanwhile, in the bucket shop, they had old prices. So he was able to arbitrage that opportunity and make a ton of money off these bucket shops. So they pretty much banned him from these bucket shops, uh, and he started building up a pretty decent nest egg. And then he actually went over into Chicago and learned how to actually trade, not just arbitrage, right? And he built up a really massive uh, nest egg, essentially, and then lost everything uh, in the early 1900s. I believe it was 1907. Uh, the market crashed, so he lost everything and built up his fortune again. And then lost everything by 1929 when that crash happened. So, and then after the Great Depression, right, built it all up again, lost it all again, and then unfortunately ended up killing himself. Uh, and there's so many lessons in that book that I think we can all learn from because it doesn't matter how wealthy you get or how much money you have, whatever the case is, if you think you're the best trader in the world which at the time, this guy was. This guy really was the best trader in the entire world and lost everything three times over just because he got so overconfident in his bets that on the on the drawdown, during the drawdown periods, he couldn't size down because he was so used to sizing up, right, and making large bets that that overconfidence really killed him. And unfortunately, yes, did actually kill him in the end uh, so that was a really great example I think that a lot of people can learn from if you haven't read the book I actually read it every now and again just as like a good grounder to make sure like I'm always on point when it comes to my risk exposure and my frequency of trading because that's something that a lot of people don't take into account is like the real risk in the market the market is extremely risky and being a day trader, you know, you look at some of the people day trading and all you guys see is the socials. Like, you guys see, even me, like, in yachts, traveling, like, doing whatever, going on vacation, sharing cigars, and the reality is very much not like that, right? You're kind of only seeing the highlights because who really wants to post uh, me sitting at a desk for 12 hours a day, uh, five days a week, right? Maybe even seven days a week because I'm working on weekends. Who really, who really wants to see that, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, there's there's a real risk in taking bets in the market. And understanding, like, once you're getting overconfident, you have to size down and make sure that you're keeping your ego in check. Because that's the biggest thing. If your ego gets out of control, like, forget about it, man. That All that wealth that you worked so hard for can evaporate very quickly. So another example that I kind of stumbled upon was... Um, a gentleman named My Mayasashi Son. He was um, part of SoftBank. I don't know if he was the CEO or manager, but he might have been the CEO of SoftBank. And uh, he was running this firm. It was called Vision Fund. And they took really large outsized bets in the tech sector during COVID. Uh, and a lot of them, you know, took a nosedive. And essentially, he kept adding on the way down. And his fund suffered losses up to forty billion dollars. Yes, four zero forty billion. Um, and he was personally on the on the hook for roughly eight or nine billion. Uh, and this was only within like a quarter or so. I think within like a couple months, they were you know sustaining massive massive losses in the market, all because he was taking really risky options plays that, you know, kind of were running against him and he's, he was adding on the way down. So he's just another example of somebody that, you know, you would consider these guys as being smart money. And we'll talk about somebody else in a little bit, but you would consider Mayasashi son as being smart money, right? He's got power, he's got connections, he has infinite amount of money essentially, you know, ex excess of $50 billion. Um, but sustaining those massive losses like that from a few poor decisions from one person, right? It's not like somebody uh, approved these trades or whatever. He kind of just went out and placed the trades on his own. 
right? I don't think there was anybody in the risk department that was saying like, yo, you got to slow down. Um, you know, just a f few poor financial decisions can really ruin you. And that's the real risk in the markets. And that's the real risk of being a day trader is it's not all, you know, sunshine and rainbows. So this third person I'm going to talk about, his name is uh, Gabe Plotkin. And if you guys don't know who he is, he's the CEO of Melvin Capital. And I highly recommend you guys watch Dumb Money. So that movie basically depicts all these different characters and all their different walks of life and how they're participating in the markets and the effect that it's having on some of their lives, right? Like Roaring Kitty was able to hit it out of the park, turning his $30,000 investment into multi-millions of dollars. Uh, and then there was a nurse who pretty much was investing all of her savings into GameStop. Uh, at the time, she was in negative $4,000 in debt and grew it to essentially, I think it was like 300 k but then round-tripped it all the way back down to zero. And then at the end of the movie, she was actually in debt again. So that's another story. And then we have Gabe Plotkin, who, you know, was running Melvin Capital. Essentially, they had... Uh, $13 billion assets under management and lost nearly $6 billion of that just in one trade, right? So just because some of these people are in high positions and positions of power where they have the money, they have the connections, um, there's real risk in the markets. And the markets don't care if you're Gabe Plotkin or if you're Ken Griffin or if you're Maya sashi son or if you're Jesse Livermore. Like, all these guys have lost tremendous amounts of money from poor financial decision making, not keeping their risk in check. And that's the biggest risk really as a day trader is keeping your risk in check. And I'm not just talking about your personal account. I'm talking about the nest egg that you've built, right? If you've worked so hard for all this capital that you've put in, like let's say you've worked so hard for all these accounts that you've built up to a funded stage, right? You're doing yourself a disservice by taking that one bad trade where it's going to blow you up, right? You have to second think and tr triple think every decision that you take in the market because that one decision that you make, that one poor decision could essentially ruin you. And that is the real risk of participating in the markets. It's not just the real risk of being a day trader because it goes beyond just being a day trader. There's people that are investing, investing way too much money in that specific play. And a good example is Wall Street Bets. If you guys haven't been on Wall Street Bets, I just go on there for entertainment essentially. And it's really sad because you see a lot of people, you know, putting their 401ks into one shitty stock option play or putting their entire net worth, however much they've saved, into terrible, you know, stock option play. And it's honestly it's kind of sickening because it's a lot of people like make jokes out of it and stuff, but on the other end of that post, right, is somebody that's actually losing everything that they've worked for. So I hope this video was insightful to you guys, and I hope you guys really take this seriously and apply it to your trading and how you're thinking about moving forward as a trader, right? Like, do you want to lower your exposure? Let's say if you're buying too many challenges right now, you're overexposing yourself to risk. You know, maybe it's credit risk. Maybe you're buying too many challenges, or maybe you're taking way too many trades. You have to slow down a little bit and put things into perspective and understand that you're taking massive risks in the market to try and better your future. But you don't have to do that in that manner. You can take small calculated risks and it'll eventually propel you to where you wanna go. And I think that's the whole message of this video is you know, set yourself up for success and don't make poor decisions based on your greed or your emotions, your excitement, right? Really keep that ego in check and, you know, your future self is going to thank you. So if you guys found this video enjoyable, hit like, hit subscribe, leave a comment, and I'll see you guys in the next one.